Well, it's great to be with you this morning. Since the last time I stood in front of you and preached, uh, we have had another addition to the Pickett household. <laughs> Olive is now over eight weeks old. Um, so if I am heckled during the meeting, it's probably going to be her. Um, <clears throat> if uh, you're brand new here and you don't know who I am, uh, first of all, you are most welcome. Thank you so much for coming. You made a good choice coming when I'm speaking. It's going to be good. Um, I love Jesus. I love my wife and my kids. I have three children. This works now. Oh, yeah. Oh, look how cute they are. Look how cute they are. Guess what photo we're using for our Christmas presents this year? <laughs> and I, I work in the church here where I get to support this wonderful, amazing community of people, and in particular, the students that go along to Edge Hill. And we do all that we can to, to lead people into life, and life in all of its fullness. And we believe that Jesus is at the very center of that. Um, and I do really believe that we are called to live life to the full, and yet the reality of our lives, as, as God has been telling us this morning, is that we find ourselves in situations where it doesn't seem that we're living a life that is totally flourishing, a, a life of abundance. How, how do we reconcile that with our walk and with our, with our faith in Jesus? And, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about this morning, uh, about this, this disorienting reality in the midst of the plan of God in our lives. Um, <clears throat> many of you will be aware that Oh, a year ago now, a year ago, um, Phoebe had to go and have a major open heart surgery, which was uh, quite traumatic <laughs> um, for us, a uh, little one-year-old, not even a one-year-old then. Um, but just as a community with, with losing Gwen and losing Steve and, and losing Dave Foreman and, and with all of the challenges that are presented to us and and so stuff that we've experienced as a community, stuff that I've experienced individually, this whole, um, this whole kind of topic of, of suffering and what we do in the midst of suffering in our walk with Jesus has been something that God has, has really been pressing on my heart over the last year, year and a half. Um, and I think it's really important for us to engage in. And, and just as a caveat, you're not going to hear... <laughs> every single possible answer that you can hear with the problem of suffering because that there is an inherent mystery in all of that. And I'm grateful that God has already spoken through, through Jeff and through John this morning that, that cover different facets of how we can deal with the disorienting reality when we face problems in our lives, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to read a couple of verses from Isaiah um, Isaiah 43, 1 to 4. So you can open your Bibles there or you can turn your Bibles on. And I'm going to be doing some other references throughout, um, throughout the, the talk as well. Um, but they're on the screen, so don't worry if um, you don't have, uh, have the words, uh, have your Bible with you. Um, <clears throat> so Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you and nations in exchange for your life. Like many of you here, oh, sorry, I didn't flick through this as I was going through. That's my bad. Um, like many of you here, um, I want to make decisions that lead to a life that just feels good. It just feels great. I, I want a life that's pleasurable and has good feelings. Um, I've only met one person in my life before who, uh, who didn't want that. He, he asked for us to pray for him to have endurance at one point. He said, you do realize if we ask for you to have more endurance, you're going to be presented with things that will force you to endure. Yes, yes, I still want it. So uh, we prayed for him uh, 
questioned his sanity as well, but we did pray for him. Um, <clears throat> but I, I do things and I make des- decisions to, to promote pleasure and avoid difficulty. So for like example, you know, most of the decisions I've made in my life, um, uh, the person that I married, um, she's great, she's not here, so you know that, oh, she is here. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the person that I've married, uh, where I live, the job that I do, um, the hobbies and friends that I've, I've chosen, the sports I play, I, I like them. They bring me pleasure. Uh, and we want to live the best life that we can without pain, without suffering, without negativity and crises. And, and we, we think and believe that a life with Jesus at the cent- is at the center of seeing that vision come to reality. And it is so true. But for many of us, it is, it's kind of distorted. Because we read in Scripture that, in fact, we were created for greatness. Did you know that? You were created for greatness. You were created for total and utter freedom. You were created for God. You were created for eternal communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You were created so that the Holy Spirit might permeate every pore in your body. You were created that your heart might be pure, that you might see his face. You were created that you might participate in the inner life of God himself. You've got a great future in God. But the way you're going to get there is through this disorienting path at times. And it's not the way that you thought. And the pathway is not a life purely of good feelings without stress. And so what Isaiah is here trying to illustrate to the people of Israel um, is, is this journey of life, the journey of the spiritual life, the journey of growing up. And this journey is going to be repeated throughout their lives, throughout our lives. You don't just do it once and you're done. Um, it happens over and over again. And it's got these three simple movements. Um, there's orientation, there's uh, disorientation, and then there's reorientation. And, and this is going to frame how we structure our passage. So the first is orientation. This is where things are really secure. I've got a sense of location. I know where I am. I know what's happening. And then there's this thing called disorientation, where there is pain and there is dislocation. Life was good, and all of a sudden now, I've been moved, and I'm dislocated, I'm out of place, I'm out of whack, I don't know where I am, I'm disoriented, I'm bewildered, I'm confused, I'm baffled, I'm overwhelmed, I don't like this. Anyone identify with those feelings there? Um, And and then we go to reorientation, and that's a place of new relocation, a place of security, of, of new revelation in God. But it's not bringing you back to the same place as where you were when you first set out on your journey. It is a reorientation. You are different than you were before. But to get to the reorientation, you've got to go through the disorientation. And this really is the history of the people who are listening to Isaiah preach. They were in Egypt, and then they were delivered from Egypt. And and this is their place of orientation. They were free. Life was on the up. Life was looking good. And then through stupid mistakes and decisions that they they went through, they ended up in the wilderness for 40 years. That was a place of total disorientation. What's going on? Living day to day, one day at a time with with manna and with quail coming. And a whole load of other stuff was going on. And and then they ended up in this period of reorientation where um, they came to the promised land of Canaan. And it was wonderful for them. The problem, though, is that it's not just a one-time deal. And as they're listening to Isaiah, they're listening to him talking about this disorienting situation that is going to be thrown their way. Um, They've got all of these empires that are coming and invading their land. And at the prospect of this, they're saying, we've done this already. (laughs) We've gone through these crises. We've gone through these difficulties We went through the confusing experiences of life and now we're done because now we're looking for the steady, steady, secure where I know what's happening and where I can have some control. And Isaiah comes and says, no, that's not the way that you mature. That's not the way you grow up. That's not the way that God works. 
And so here is the context in chapter 43, and I'm just going to try and quickly summarize. There's a lot of history going on, but I'll try and do it briefly. The, the Assyrians were the world superpower, and they were threatening Israel. Um, but by the time we get to here in chapter 43, um, what's happened is that Babylon have come, and they've totally wiped out the Assyrians. And the Babylonians, they were worse than the Assyrians. They, they destroyed the temple, and they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. The city was in total ruin. In fact, it was in danger of never, ever being built again. So then the Israelites were scattered throughout the Babylonian Empire for a period of 70 years. And so just imagine, put yourself into their situation. First, everything was great, and then the Assyrians came, and there's all this pressure. And then the Babylonians came, and they, they conquered and, and destroyed the Assyrians and destroyed Jerusalem in turn. And then they were completely deported almost entirely the whole population. And then what's happening here is Isaiah comes and says, listen, guys, I know it's been 70 years. We're, we're all living in Babylon now. I know that you, you've kind of got yourself secure, but, but it's going to happen where God is going to do something and disorient you. He's going to relocate you. The Persians are coming. And God is sending a guy named Cyrus, and he's going to be the emperor, and he's going to go and take over the Babylonians. He's going to wipe them out, and he's going to come, and he's going to conquer. And God says, I'm going to use him. And by the way, this guy is, an, uh, is a pagan idolater. <laughs> and the Israelites don't like this plan at all. It sounds bonkers. Why would we do this? And so this is where we're at with Isaiah writing here, conquered by the Assyrians, then conquered by the Babylonians, and now the Persians are going to come and conquer them. There's all this dislocation, there's all this movement, and it's so frustrating because they're just trying to get steady on their feet. And God says, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to send you 700 miles. You can see the difference there between Babylon and Jerusalem. He's going to uproot all of these people and send them back to Jerusalem um, where uh, it's going to take you four months through a desert, not on some cozy coach or train or anything like that. Students, you've got it all right today in your pilgrimage back home. Um, yes, there's going to be bandits. Yes, there's going to be trouble. You're going to leave all of your security. You're going to go back to Jerusalem, which, by the way, is a city in ruins, and you're going to rebuild it You'll be poor, you'll suffer, but I am going to be there with you. I am going to do a new thing. And so God comes into this situation. He says, I'm running the world whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not. And God just wants to come and give perspective to the Israelites here. Let me, let me grow you up on the nature of life and, and the way that you mature and get free and become all that I've told and called you to be. This is the spiritual journey. Orientation, disorientation, reorientation. And so when we go back to the verses um, that I mentioned before, when you, when you pass through the waters, this is a symbol of, of chaos and destruction. God says, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. You will not be overwhelmed. When you walk through the fire, another symbol of destruction, quite obviously, when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. It's not going to consume you. It's not going to destroy you. And it's a Hebrew way of saying no matter what trial comes in your way, whatever sort, water, fire, all of it is under my control, and I am the one who says this far you will take this trial and no further. But it's not just here in this situation that we see this take place. It's, it's revisited time and time again in the Bible. It's like David, you know, he, King David, everything is going great. It's going fabulous. He's got a great job as the musician for King Saul. Um, and, you know, he's making a bit of money. He's getting a bit of name for himself. Then all of a sudden, Saul gets jealous. He wants to kill him. And he's running for his life. Everything was wonderful last week. And, the, and then he's, he's on, his, on the run, and he's going, and he's living in caves. He's living with bandits. He's living with outcasts. And there's this long period of 15 years before David can come and step into that which God has told him to be. Or, or think of Peter. When Peter's like, he has this revelation of Jesus as the Messiah. Everything's going great. 
And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, hey, by the way, I'm going to get crucified. And Peter says, no, 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 hey, Jesus, you can't, you can't be saying that. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. I mean, how disorienting must that have been for Peter, that climb down from that moment? It, it must have felt like everything was crumbling around him. Same thing with Jonah. Jonah's good until God sends him to a place where he doesn't want to go. Sends him to Nineveh. Before he knows it, he's in the belly of a fish. What's that about? But look at the lives of of Moses, of Joshua, of Naomi and Ruth, of Elijah and Esther, the disciples and Paul and all the different church communities that went through persecution and famine and and so many more stories in the Bible. And and right now we are in a a post World War world that is literally built around making me as comfortable as I can be. And so this message is really uncomfortable. And so when the tough times come, when they hit us, they hit us hard and they disorient us. We're we're not challenged, we're not trained, we're, we're not learned in these really difficult situations. But God comes and he says, you can Trust me. And, and something profound happens in your, in your oneness, in your, in your union, in your relationship with Jesus that can happen in no other place but through disorientation. And it brings about a unique transformation in our character and in our relationship with Jesus. In 1991, um, there was this uh, Texas oil billionaire. His name was Ed Bass. Has anyone ever heard of him before? He, um, as billionaires is there once, decided to chuck a load of money at a project that uh, (laughs) went nowhere, and it was called Biosphere 2. It was situated in between two deserts in in Arizona, and it was a sealed glass world, as you can see from the picture. And they put eight scientists there from seven different countries, and basically they wanted to see if they could replicate the, the Earth's environment, the Earth's ecosystem in an artificial way in this kind of glass biosphere thing. Uh, The glass dome had oxygen, had insects and fish, had a rainforest and soil for growing food, and an artificial ocean with a wave machine. Can you imagine how much money this guy has wasted on this enterprise? The scientists initially were super, super excited because they planted um, plants and trees, and they grew a lot quicker than if they were outside in the world. Um, But what happened is many of the trees, they began to fall um, before they reached their reproductive stage. And they found out that the absence of wind in that glass dome could not produce trees uh, trees that were strong enough. The wood was too weak to reproduce. And they found that trees needed strong headwinds Um, and that they were absolutely necessary to produce trees that were just simply strong enough. It's very interesting, you know, that this whole dynamic of why do I have to go through fires and waters and get overwhelmed to get strong? Uh, In the 16th century, a Spanish priest known as St. John of the Cross, anyone heard of St. John of the Cross? David Rayner, legend. Um, He wrote a highly influential book, and known as the, the Dark Night of the Soul. Um, he went through some traumatic circumstances himself. He was, uh, he was put into torture for his faith. And he wrote this book as a kind of a reflection on, on life and on that season. And he said that the reason for this, this disorientation and the dark night was that, that there are these false images of God that we carry that have to be destroyed. And these false beliefs about God, that they have to be rooted out of us. And the only way they're going to be rooted out of us is not from hearing it preached. It has to be lived. It's got to be lived. And he says that the biggest thing that happens in disorientation is you're no longer following God because of the good feelings you're getting from him. You're actually following him for him. And, and the only way to pull you from following God for what you're getting out of it is to, is to pull you into disorientation, that you go through fire and water. And so we don't get attached to just the good feelings that we have about God. We get actually attached to God for who he is. And it's such a big difference between the two. And so where do we go from here? 
What do we do if we find ourselves in this season of disorientation? Well, the first, I think, is to, um, and, and just to say again, just to repeat, I'm going to share three things here, but that is not a, a, a panacea for, for all of it. But I think finding peace in the age of distraction is, is really, really key. For, uh, for me, one of the things that I know that I have done and that I'm prone to do is to distract myself from stuff that is going on. The 17th century thinker Blaise Pascal in a a famous essay says, most of the troubles of the human race can be traced to the fact that people cannot spend time on their own in a room. Uh, I'd like to add to that, by the way, not scrolling on their phone. (laughs) It means on on your own. And he has this whole section about how we cannot cope with the bigger questions of life and death. In a way, we fear death. We, we fear annihilation. We fear that we might be meaningless, we, that we might mean nothing, that we might not be loved. We fear all these sorts of different things that are lurking around in the background, and we cope with them by distracting ourselves. That's one of the ways that we do. And, and Blaise Pascal is talking in the 17th century, and yet now we live in an era where there is literally an endless stream of stuff that can just entertain you or interest you and take that, that anxiety and the fear away. So when we talk about distraction, distraction is one of those things that, that covers up our lack of peace and our anxiety, and our, 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 our ultimate anxiety about a lot of things. And so they've become these coping mechanisms that, that we have to deal with disorientation. We find these distractions. These, these things aren't bad in themselves. Mobile phones are not bad. They're great. Um, <clears throat> very, very useful. Very, very useful. I don't really remember a time when I didn't have a phone. I'm sure there are people. I don't know why I'm looking at you, Jeff. I'm sorry. <laughs> but having hobbies or, or watching Netflix or, or doing work and having your social life, whatever it may be, these things aren't necessarily bad. But when they become a distraction from actually thinking about the bigger things of life, life and death, meaning and purpose, love and our our fear that we don't have those things, it should be a big red flag. And it actually leads us to to medicate away our problems uh, without actually dealing with them. And in many senses, it just ends up replacing God and our relationship with him. And I I think in the world that, that we're in, where you, you just see everybody desperately seeking distraction of one kind or another, that's a sign of the lack of peace that we sometimes experience. But Jesus comes, and he starts speaking about peace quite significantly. And in John 14, Jesus speaks about peace, and he says, peace I give you, but not as the world gives. And that makes you think out of, uh, thinks about, you know, what are the differences between the peace that Jesus brings and the peace of the world? The peace in the world are those, those little moments of quiet, you know, when you, that you get perhaps in a day or two. I don't know the last time that we had a moment of peace in our household. Or, or when you're on holiday or, or things like that. You know the kind of thing that I'm talking about. But, but then with Jesus, there's a, there's a big difference because after he's been crucified and after he's been resurrected, the very first thing he says to the disciples is, peace be with you. And I think that's the significant thing about the peace that the Bible talks about. Ultimately, it is a peace that comes from the other side of the grave. And that's why it's different from anything that the world brings, because the world cannot do that. It cannot bring a peace uh, from the other side of the grave. And the great news is this, that God has given us the Holy Spirit so that Jesus can be present inside each and every one of us. And as we are present with him and remaining close to Jesus, peace begins to seep into the corners of our lives. And that's huge. But if we are living in this age of distraction, then we are being distracted from remaining close with Jesus. I remember when I first started practicing silence with Jesus, uh, just trying to spend five to ten minutes a day in silence before God with no other agenda than to just simply be present with him. And this was really difficult for me um, because I don't enjoy doing nothing. I would, I would not be the savior of this world, <laughs> according to Blaise Pascal. Um, uh, and, and I remember the first times that I was doing it and I was making myself present to him. And I realized how much I'd papered over my anxieties 
and my stresses with distraction. I remember beginning, I was sat at my desk, and as I was just trying to be present with Jesus, I just remember my hands starting to tremble and to shake. And, and, and the worry and the, the waves of anxiety that came crashing over me because I'd just been getting the job done. I'd just been doing life and not been super intentional about being with Jesus. That's me. I'm a, I'm a leader in the church. Falling to this age of distraction and covering over my peace. The other thing that I'd like to talk about is that you have been set in community. Um, So for this, I wonder if we could do a little visual example. So if everybody can just stand up, and if you can't, if you could... uh, Thanks, David. Look at that. Straight away. Just raise your hand to indicate that you are stood up. And as I'm speaking, if any of these things apply to you now or if they have applied to you in the future, could you please just sit down? Okay? So if you have been through or are going through life-threatening illnesses, cancer, stroke, heart attacks, um, or living through crippling pain or disability, sit yourself down. Um, If you have uh, witnessed loved ones succumb to dementia or other illnesses that that waste them away, please just sit down. Um, If you've been through difficult breakups, adultery, sudden job losses, sit yourselves down. Serious financial insecurities. If you've been through abuses of power and trust, sit yourselves down. If you've been through betrayal or infertility or miscarriages, sit yourself down. Sudden loss of loved ones, wayward children, broken families where there's hatred and bitterness. Addictions that have been destroying you or your family. Loss of purpose, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, self-harming, God feeling distant or absent, Serious questions about the goodness of God, about the Bible being relevant today, total loss of faith. My goodness. I think we should just get Emmanuel to come up and and speak. The point is that aside from Emmanuel, he was just something else. (laughs) There is a shared experience of pain and suffering in this room. God has set us in community for purpose. And one of those, quite simply, is is to love and to support each other. And to love and support each other with the same love that Jesus has shown us. He said, no greater love is there than this, than to lay one's life down for a friend. My mantra to the students, but equally to each one of you, is suffering in silence is not a successful strategy. We can be praying, and we do so well, particularly for people that are going through illnesses and difficulties like that. But but do do we share with those that we're close with actually what is going on internally? The fears, the doubts, the hopes, our dreams. It doesn't just have to be negative, but the positive stuff as well. We can be honest, be open, be vulnerable. Tap into the amazing resource that is the community of people that God has put us together with. For love, for wisdom, for support. Discipleship is always done in community. And the last point I want to say, if he's going to let me, trust in Jesus, big type. So let's just nip back to Isaiah 43 because Part of what God is saying in there is that when when you're in disorientation and you're going to be in it, I want you to understand something about how I, God, feel about you. And in verse um, 4, he says, Since you were precious and honored in my sight, next page, since we are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Some of us, if not all of us, at some point in our lives have, have had an image of God in our minds where he's constantly frustrated with us. He's angry, he's, he's irritated, he's disappointed. Maybe he's self-righteous. Maybe he's explosive. He's unpredictable. Uh, and God's maybe more of a, a prosecutor than a defense attorney. 
But God comes and just wipes that all away here and says, you are precious. And, and that is a word for a groom over his bride. You are precious and honored in my sight. You may think that I've abandoned you, but you are precious to me. I'm, I'm on this whole thing because I'm bringing you to reorientation. It's not a mistake, and you can trust me. You are honored, and you are loved. Oh, goodness, you are such a treasure. God pursues us. He pursues you because he loves you so much. He actually came to earth and died for you to show his love for you. And, and so he says in verse 5, he says it in verse 2. In fact, it's all over his eye. He says, don't be afraid. 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 He offers rest. He says, I want to, I want to comfort you. I love you. And what you get from these verses is, is the passion of God. He's passionately in love with you and with me. And he, he's growing you and setting you free. It's just not the way you thought it would be. So as we close here, if we could just do one more visual example, okay? I like my visual examples. So <clears throat> I'm going to say some stuff here. And if it's relevant to you, I'd like you to stand up this time, or if you can't stand up, raise your hand to indicate. And as I go on, if there's more than one thing that applies to you, please, I strongly encourage you to respond with shouts and hallelujahs um, and any kind of joyful noise that you might have, okay? If you have ever experienced God's healing power physically over your body, please stand up. Hallelujah. I mean, before I go on, let's just pause there. And look at the people that are stood in this room. People that testify to the fact that God has intervened miraculously and seen healing in their body. And in a time when we are calling out on the Lord for the various situations that are in our community of people, this is incredible. Lord, do it again. Um, if you have ever been set free from addiction to drugs, to smoking, alcohol, porn, or any other destructive habits, please stand up. Uh, if you found reconciliation in broken relationships with spouses, with children, with friends, with family, stand yourself up. Miraculously been provided for when there's been little money or resource. Got the job when least expected. Been freed from the prison of mental health issues like self-harm or bulimia, schizophrenia, PTSD, or anything like that experience the presence of Jesus like nothing else when in the face of significant trauma. Been depressed but given hope. Been down but lifted up. Been trapped by anxiety but found peace. Doors opened when all had been closed. Been lost but been found. Exhausted but given strength. Filled with self-hatred but now overflowing in love. Broken but made whole. Walking but now running. Cold but now set alight. Confused but being given wisdom. Lonely but found friendship. Disoriented but then reoriented. Sorrowful but found joy. Empty but now full. Dead but now alive. The resurrection power of Jesus. Look around. A living, breathing, beating, walking, talking, no denying testimony to the power and love of God. Hallelujah. 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 You sit yourselves down. <laughs> Disorientation is a necessary and pivotal part of our discipleship to Jesus Christ. It's where the old goes and the new comes, and we are conformed to be like the image of Christ. It's a key means by which we are brought to maturity. At some point or other, we will go through this. If you're not in disorientation now, don't worry, you will be at some point in the future. <laughs> it's painful, it's difficult, it literally hurts like hell. But we are here for you, and God is there for you. Be aware of what is taking place. Don't distract yourself to oblivion. Practice the presence of Jesus. Hunger for his peace. Be in community. 
Don't just be a part of it, but be in the community and remember that God is bringing you closer to him and that you will know him for who he truly is. Father, we just come before you now in whatever season of life that we are in and we just want to say thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice that he made for each one of us. A a demonstration of your passionate love that is is driving and pursuing to set us free and father when in the midst of these whether we've been through it before and we've been confused or we're confused now we're going to be confused in the future father we just want to come and surrender our lives to you afresh and say lord it's your way not our way and we come before you and say we trust you in the midst of the bewilderment and the disorientation, Lord, we trust you. And Lord, that we might know your presence in new and unfounded ways than ever before. Lord, that, that we might have a testimony as a community here of being a people of your presence and of your peace. Father, we thank you for the amazing people that you have set us in community with. And we think of all of those people that that inspire us and we see what they've gone through in their lives. And Lord, we thank you for what you have done in their life. And we ask that we would be bold and have the courage to be vulnerable with one another, that we can drive this community to be all that you have called it to be. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.